Let us pray. Almighty God, you are here in this place. Help us to focus our eyes on you this morning as we listen, as we sing, as we read, as we learn, as we worship. We ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. We have been raised with Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God. In Christ, we have put away the old self and are made new. As we worship this day and every day, let us set our minds on things above. Let us join together now as we sing our opening hymn, our hymn of praise, number 443, Trust and Obey, hymn number 443. Let us stand together as we sing. need to ask you a question. Have you ever played the game I Spy? Where somebody calls out something and, and you, you have to look for it and try to find it? 
I'm going to ask you a question. Landon, right where you are, can you see Miss Aaron? Can you see Miss Aaron? Can you see her, Rustin? <coughs> Samuel, can you see Miss... <coughs> Miss Betty playing the piano? It's over there. Can you see her face? Just barely. Can you see her, Nora? Now stand up. Stand up, Nora. Can you see her now? You're higher. You can see a little bit better. I'm going to show you a picture. You can sit back down. And do you think this guy can see really well? Can he see lots of mountains and things? He's way up high, isn't he? Hmm? Is he parachuting? No, he's just standing on the edge of a cliff. And he's right up there, actually. Do you think he can see really well up that high? Maybe that's why he likes to sit in the balcony. He likes high places. Sometimes we can see things when we're in a different place than better than we can see when we're down low. Do you know what the wonderful part is? God can see everything all the time, even things we can't see, things we're afraid of. We may not need to be afraid of because God's looking at them. And God's looking after us and walking beside us all the time. So God walks in front of us. God walks beside us. And God walks behind us. So even when we can't see the future or we can't see something that might be scaring us, we can know that God is right there with us all the time, every time. Even when we're standing on the edge of a cliff looking out over the mountains, God, God's especially there. Let's have prayer together. <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you know all about us. You know the questions that we're going to ask before we ask them. And you know the answers. We pray that you'd always remind us of who you are and how much you love us. These things we pray in Christ. Amen. As we mentioned this morning, David is out of town, and we are honored to have Dr. Lydia Hoyle preaching for us this morning. She is a native of Drexel, North Carolina. She studied at Appalachian State University, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is the Associate Professor of Church History and Baptist Heritage at Campbell University Divinity School. She has been there since 2003. Um, she teaches about Christian history, American religion, and Baptist history. Uh, many of her areas of study have been about women in missions, children in mission education, Baptist history, and women in ministry. And she's currently working on a study of Baptists and children. We are delighted to have her preaching for us this morning and look forward to the words that she will share with us. As we continue in worship, let us read from Colossians chapter 3. So if you have been raised in, with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. 
On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Creating and recreating God, you have called us to new life in you, a life marked by your love, a life that looks at things through your perspective. But we confess that it's difficult to completely strip off the old self. We confess to you that we have looked to ourselves and ignored the needs of others. We confess that we have let anger and malice rule within us rather than compassion and gentleness. We confess that we have given in to greed over your ways time and again. Forgive us, O Lord. Call us once again to life in you, a life that seeks justice and restoration a life that looks beyond divisions and sees your image in each person we meet. It's in the name of the risen Christ that we pray. Amen. Let us join together now in singing our offertory hymn number 372, I Then Shall Live, hymn number 372. Let us stand as we sing.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you this morning so thankful that indeed our debts are paid and that we are forgiven people. We pray that because of this we will be able to live in your love and to show your love to a world that needs to see it and feel it so desperately. We pray that as we give, that we might receive the humility and the love and the grace that can only come through you. We pray that as we give and that as we love, that you will love us as we have loved others. This you have promised. These things we pray in Christ. Amen.
when you hear amazing singing like that, it's, it's a little to me like watching the gymnastics in the Olympics where you're just like right on the edge. Can they make it? Can they do it? And then they hit the big note and it's like they did it. And so it's very exciting. I'm very happy to be with you today. M maybe there's someone out there that remembers I've been here before. It's maybe um, five or six years ago or something like that. And you may not remember me, but I remember you. And what a warm and affirming congregation this is. I <clears throat> That Sunday, I still remember, I got kind of confused when I was coming down the road trying to get to your church and I ended up I don't know, it, it, it didn't look like a good part of town. And <clears throat> I was really afraid and I got more turned around and somehow I got back here and it was about five minutes till 11 when I arrived. So it was before you started having our early service or at least I wasn't speaking at it. And I still remember coming in and uh, one of the deacons met me and he was like, we've been praying you were gonna make it because I guess the whole deacon board was, you know, sort of casting lots to see who was going to have to preach. <laughs> and, um, and so I don't know if it was because there had been so much praying going on or what, but it, it, it was a, a wonderful service and I have great uh, memories of this congregation. So I've sung your praises for the last few years and I'm glad to be back with you here today. <clears throat> I have a little bit of frog in my throat today, so please forgive me. Every summer of my childhood, my mom would spend a week or two of her summer vacation hanging out with her sister in this big old white frame classic mountain home where she had been raised. Mom and her siblings had not sold their that farm on which they grew up. Um, and so it was available for all of them to kind of come back and to travel back home. It was in Wilkes County, North Carolina. Does anyone know that area? Wilkesboro and North Wilkesboro, which are, I guess, sister cities, and Perlier was the little non-town where my um, mom's property was. My uh, mom and her siblings owned several hundred acres there in on across the hillsides of Wilkes County and there were a couple of streams running on the property, some forest land, lots of fields, um, just a beautiful place and my brother and sister and I just loved playing in the fields and in the woods and in the streams there. <clears throat> but what I loved most of all was the blackberry bushes that filled with berries every summer. Some of my earliest memories are of picking those berries with my mom. The two of us were kind of strangely committed to the blackberries. And we would get up early in the morning while the dew was still on the grass, while it was still cool, and we would hike up the mountainsides and find these little thickets of blackberries. We would pick and pick and pick. We would pick enough to make cobblers for that week while we were in the mountains. We would pick enough to freeze berries for the future. And then we would make, I would say dozens of jars of blackberry jam that we ate on peanut butter sandwiches all year long and that my mom gave to her friends and relatives. Even as a child, that whole process of picking the berries and smashing them and freezing them and, and putting them in jars and canning them was something of a holy process to me. Even the scratches that I got all over my arms and legs, which I always did, only seemed to intensify the value of those berries to me. Four years ago, my mom uh, moved to her heavenly address where I'm sure there's lots of berries with no thorns, <laughs> but she left behind a daughter committed to the picking and preservation of these ephemeral fruits. So now 
as the weather warms up and July approaches, I start turning my eyes to the mountains where I know these treasures await me. Now, I've lived here in the eastern half of the state for 13 years now, and I know there are blackberries on this side of the state, <clears throat> but I've got to say the best ones are in the mountains, in the high elevations. I think it's something about the elevation and the cool air and the dewy mornings that just make blackberries thrive. So in my view, the ju juiciest, tastiest blackberries are found on those mountain hillsides. I don't know the science of it, but it seems elevation matters. Here it is, the end of July. So I can tell you, two weeks ago, I made my annual pilgrimage up to the mountain in search of blackberries. And for a week, every day, I started my day by heading out the door, up a various group of pathways to find these berries. And my daughter came alongside me to pick it seems that she too shares that sense of holiness in the picking of these berries. So we would go looking, lifting up the branches to find these hidden gems hidden in the midst of the leaves and the thorns. If you've never gone blackberry picking, man, you're missing something in life. Well, these days in the mountains, a week ago now, changed me a little. They always change me a little. Because when I get in the mountains, I feel like I'm able to kind of clear my mind and clear my heart and focus on the things that are important and clear away some of that morass of mess <laughs> that remains behind me on the low ground. Year after year, as I walk up mountain paths, I'm reminded of the words my mom spoke again and again to me from the psalmist. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help, as it says in King James. But this past week when I was picking berries, I also reflected on this passage here in Colossians. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then almost a, an exact repetition then, it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your heart on things above. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. If you're like me, you've heard this biblical command actually belittled most of your life. Again and again, I've heard the old adage, some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And you hear that in several different forms, but that's the gist of it. In one short sentence, the call of God's kind of thrown out the window. Strangely, unlike many adages, I really don't feel like there are a lot of people that fit in this category. I mean, I've known maybe one or two people that were maybe a little, a little floaty-minded. <laughs> uh, maybe you could say too heavenly-minded. There's no big grassroots movement who, of people who are all saying, man, we're just, we're gonna think about heavenly things and throw away the earth or something. I don't see it. Still, many of us have a stronger allegiance to that saying about worrying about being too heavenly minded than we do to the call of God to put our minds on things above. We simply don't want to be too heavenly minded. We don't want to be odd for God, after all. We don't want to seem like Luna Lovegood in the Harry Potter series. <clears throat> well, yeah. I like Luna myself, just for the record. 
Instead, we want to speak our minds and say what we think. We don't want to seem too godly. In fact, most of the time, we even celebrate those who express their earthly thoughts. They speak their mind, even if those thoughts are ugly or crass or selfish or hurtful. Sadly, our earthly natures, for the most part, aren't anything we ought to brag about. The Bible doesn't call us to let it all hang out, as they used to say in the 70s, or to glory in our unrighteousness, as the Bible would say. God calls us, rather, to put to death, to rid ourselves of the verbal and physical sins that ultimately harm both us and other people. Listen to the scripture again. This time, ask God to put a finger on any word that describes <clears throat> even now, a point of struggle for you. I want you to hear it, and I want you to ask God to speak directly to you. I don't want you to listen for the sins of somebody else. We're all good at picking those out. But rather, ask the Spirit to show you if there's still something the Spirit needs to work on you about in this category of verbal and physical sin. So hear this passage, passage. This is from Colossians 3. Now I'm reading, starting at verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. Did anything here stand out for you? You don't need to call it out or anything. <laughs> that could be scary. But if the Spirit spoke to you, I encourage you to take that sin, the one that stood out to you, and look it right in the eye. Don't try to justify it. Well, if she hadn't made me mad, I wouldn't have been saying anything or such. Don't celebrate your honesty. Just see sin for what it is, sin. Now pull off that remnant of your earthly nature and abhor it as if it, you would a tick that you'd picked up while you were blackberry picking. Mentally flush that tick down the toilet and know that it's gone and you are forgiven. Sin is not the will of God for you. It is not the will of God for me. This is not our life anymore. As the scripture said, you've died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Many Christians, including myself, set aside Lent each year to focus on their sinfulness and need for forgiveness and repentance. But the truth is, we need to allow God to prune us a bit day by day, to make us more like Christ. God is calling us to a deeper conversion, to a closer walk with him every single day. If we don't keep our hearts attuned to God, sin will build up in our heart. I think of it as building up in our heart, sort of like tartar builds up on our teeth. Meanwhile, we don't even realize it's there. I'm reminded of when I was in third grade, a dentist came to our school, and he gave us these little red tablets. Does anyone remember this? Did anyone have this experience? And so first he would say, how many of you brushed your teeth this morning? And we all threw our arms up and waved them around because we were very proud. 
And then he said, well, these little tablets will show where you didn't get your teeth, where you didn't get all the bacteria off your teeth. So we put them in our mouth and chewed those little tablets up and we all opened our mouths and all over our teeth were these red spots, which was where there was still bacteria living in our mouths. Do you still do this in school? No, they've given up on little red tablets. And it's really instructional because you look in the mirror and you're, all of us are just so embarrassed, like, oh gosh. And, the, and so he, then he gives us, he gave us this little, we did this more than once. He um, gave us a little paper full of these little tablets. And so we're supposed to see if we could improve our brushing. So we would, every few days, we're supposed to chew up another tablet. And, you know, I will say, when I started focusing on it day by day, my teeth got a whole lot cleaner. Um, I think that's how it works with God. In fact, probably for about a year now, I've started a practice of every morning when I wake up, I thank God for 10 things. So I'm trying to build my thankfulness in the morning. And then in the evening, I stop and I ask God to show me where I've, where I've missed him, where I didn't see him when he was there, and when I didn't speak when I should have, and when, I, when I've spoken when I shouldn't, I've asked him to show me my sin each night. And I think it's, there's something that changes us when we're constantly seeking to confess and get rid of sin and not let it sort of rise up and, and build up till we can't even see it anymore. Amazingly, by the way, I still have stuff to confess every single day, you know, which I'm, I'm hoping to get where I don't always have something. Of course, if we do kill off all of these things <clears throat> that God condemns, all of these sins that mentioned here and others, there's a danger. We can become self-righteous and nobody can stand the self-righteous not because they're actually righteous, but because they think they are and they can't see their own sin, and that's just really aggravating. In fact, I think we kind of prefer sinners that know they're sinners than people who are sinful but think they aren't. Remember what Jesus had to say about this. In Luke 18, we read this. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day and give a tenth of all I have. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The call of God is to righteousness, to set our things, Set, set our minds, set our hearts on things above, but never to imagine that we're better than anyone else or everyone else in so doing. Somehow we all so desperately want to believe that we are fundamentally better than other folks. I think this is one of the most pervasive sins that seems to afflict the best and the worst of us. Maybe we think because our skin is a particular shade, we're better. Maybe we think because we go to a certain school or went to a certain school, go hills, we are better. Maybe we believe because we're Baptists, not Presbyterians or Pentecostals, we're better. Or maybe we believe that our own repentance puts us above other folks. This attitude in and of itself means we need to repent some more. So when Paul talks about, <clears throat> here in Colossians, putting to death our sinful ways, he closes out this conversation 
by reminding us of our solidarity, of our unity with all God's children. He says, in Christ there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. From above, these little differences that we pick out between ourselves and others aren't even visible. Brothers and sisters, our call is to set our mind on things above to embrace the compassion and kindness and love of Christ described in the verses that follow here. If you're sitting around the lunch table and can't figure out what to do with your eyeballs, you could focus them on these verses that follow, starting in chapter 3, verse 12. That's where we hear all about where our minds should be if they are set on things above. I think we should never think that we are all that, as they say, that we are better than anyone else. Our goodness, our hope, our ability to make a difference in the world rest in one thing, Christ. Christ is our life, the scripture says. Christ is our hope. Christ is our strength. Christ is our purpose. In Christ, through Christ, with Christ, our lives have value and promise. Each of us gets this one life. It may last a few hours, or it may last a hundred years if we're really lucky, but it will just be one life here. We can give this one life to fulfilling the urges, holy and unholy, that come our way. We can use people to ensure we get what we want. We can use words to harm and injure the people, even the ones closest to us. We can lie. And in the midst of it all, we can nonetheless pretend that we are better than the great majority of other people on the planet, and we can work to put others down and even to hold them there, especially if they aren't like us. We can even gloss over all that self-centeredness and self-glorification with a glaze of self-righteousness. But Christ calls us to a different kind of life, a life at a different elevation. He wants to plant us on a hillside where we live, live lives that depend on him every day. He wants to plant us at the very best place, the place where we will flourish. He wants to water us and feed us and surround us with clean air. He wants us to see we're not alone and that we're holding up the soil on that hillside alongside many other plants that he cherishes. He wants to use us to produce life-giving fruit for the world and for those around us as long as we live. This is the abundant life Christ has for us. Sisters and brothers, hear this word from the scripture. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Praise be to God. Thank you, Dr. Hoyle, for that challenging, wonderful message. This time in our worship service, we offer you the opportunity to respond to God's leading, to the Holy Spirit's 